Well, welcome everybody uh, to the second webinar of the Canadian Latin American Archaeology Society. Today we have uh, Dr. Carrie Dennett with us from Red Deer College. Uh, before we get started, just take a moment um, to acknowledge that while we are meeting on a virtual platform, uh, we would like to acknowledge as a society the importance of the land which we each call home. Uh, from coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Métis, Inuit, and First Nations people that call this land home. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Matt. I'm also going to press my record button right now, so we'll probably also hear uh, it's going to be recorded. So just one moment. Okay, perfect. So I've got the recording going. So welcome everyone to our second webinar of the fall and our first sort of official one that really starts off our speaker series. So we're really, really excited to start off with Dr. Carrie Dennett from Red Deer College, uh, a wonderful human being, a wonderful archeologist. So Carrie works at Red Deer College in the School of Arts and Sciences, and there she teaches classes in anthropology, sociology, and also justice studies, which really reflects her quite broad educational background. Before she came to archeology, span she actually did her BA in psychology and then a post-baccalaureate in criminology. And then she did her BA and MA in um, anthropology at Trent University and then her PhD in archeology span at the University of Calgary, as you were myself and Matt um, uh, also met Carrie and I was really lucky to be able to work with Carrie only for a few short weeks at the Denver Art Museum when she was a fellow there as well. And uh, Carrie is also a research associate at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of um, Natural History. And she specializes in compositional analysis of pre-Columbian ceramics. And that's what she's gonna talk to us about today. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Carrie. Thank you once again for um, agreeing to speak in our webinar series. So um, I'll be controlling Carrie's slides. And so um, if there's any technological issues with that, it's my fault and not Carrie's. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Cara. I appreciate that. Um, I would like to begin by saying, uh, hello, good afternoon, bon après-midi for my friends in Canada <laughs> and buenas tardes. Uh, to our Latin American friends. Um, I would like to thank Cara Tremaine, first of all, uh, my friend and colleague for inviting me to give this talk. And I would certainly like to thank CLOS, the Canadian Latin American Archaeology Society for the invitation to participate today. Uh, and certainly I'd like to extend that to all the membership of which I am now a part. <laughs> so I'm pleased to be part of CLOS. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you all today. Um, Cara, whenever you're ready. Wonderful, I'm gonna get the PowerPoint ready to go. I, I see three Calgary faces on my screen, including my <laughs> supervisor, who I'm very pleased to see here today. Okay. And good to see you too. Nice to see you, Jeff. Cool. So I hope that you see the PowerPoint. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to move um, on to the second slide. Go right ahead. I'm realizing at this very moment that I should have never used a white background because it's reflecting horrific light onto me and making me more ghoulish than I need to be. Um, nevertheless, off we go. So my name is Carrie Dennett. Um, I'm an archeologist uh, and I have worked for the past 10 years uh, in Pacific Nicaragua, along with my supervisor, Jeff McCafferty, who's here with us right now. Um, before that, I worked for a short time in my master's uh, on materials from Honduras. My interest is far beyond anything else, ceramic analysis. Uh, it's what I do. Uh, I'm starting here with a picture of a land mass that I hope you will all recognize. Uh, I assume you do, so we'll start with that. I'm showing you uh, just a, a basic outline of the, of the ancient Mesoamerican culture area uh, writ large. Uh, right down at the very bottom where I'm showing you the circle in the bottom left uh, is an area that, you know, there may be some debate about whether it belongs to Mesoamerica or not, uh, but for the purposes of today, uh, we will say that yes, we're coming from a Mesoamerican perspective uh, to look at the things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so the area I work in is Pacific Nicaragua. Uh, it is connected to the area of Northwest Costa Rica, which together 
uh, create the archaeological region of Greater Nicoya. Go ahead, Picard, to the next slide. Pre-Columbian Pacific Nicaragua represents the northern sector of this archaeological region. Um, and it has been the focus of my study, as I said, for the last 10 years. Um, this area, for at least 100 years, uh, has been in debate about what its cultural affiliation is. Um, depending on the perspective of the researcher, it can be considered part of Mesoamerica. From other people's perspective, other, research, other researchers', researchers perspective, sorry, um, this is a, a part, the northern extension of what we might consider the greater Chibchan area, with Chibchan speaking groups to the south that we see extend into South America. Um, a big part of what I have done in Pacific Nicaragua is try to get some idea, um, working in collaboration with my supervisor, um, about what this area actually represented in pre-Columbian times. Um, it has had a pretty straightforward three-phase narrative associated with it um, that has been kind of um, solidified, fossilized, and, and accepted as, although problematic, uh, a somewhat truthful uh, recollection of the history. Uh, so in the 10 years that I was at the University of Calgary working on ceramics, our goal was to try to get a better understanding. Uh, we really didn't understand what this area represented. We know that there are aspects that look Mesoamerican. We know that there are aspect, aspects that look Chib Chan, but we're lacking a lot of the things that you would traditionally expect to see in the Mesoamerican area. Um, there's a trait list that we look at. And although there may be big differences between the groups in Mesoamerica, they all adhere to this trait list to, to one degree or another. Um, and Pacific Nicaragua in particular, um, Greater Nicoya altogether, often don't meet the requirements of this trait list. Um, they include things like temples uh, is a big one, monumental constructions, uh, things like that, standing ball courts that we can see. The fundamentals of um, Mesoamerican worldview often appear to be missing. And for that reason, although you will often see it attached to a map of Mesoamerica, which certainly uh, you know, expands the territory, this is an area that has not received a lot of attention from Mesoamerican scholars. Um, if truth be told, several Mer Mesoamerican scholars have come to Pacific Nicaragua to uh, have a look, to try to find Mesoamerican connections. They often all disappear. <laughs> um, Jeff McCafferty is one of the people who has stayed the longest, uh, who began a career in Mesoamerica, moved to Nicaragua uh, and stayed to work through the problems. They're big, uh, they're difficult to get at, and there's a lot of mental work to be done. Um, I'm, a I'm a scientist, I like to think of myself, uh, a pseudoscientist, I'm sure, if you asked a real scientist. Um, but we have tried to use scientific technology to help us make sense, to challenge or to test the narrative that we have accepted for so long. Um, so looking at this traditional archaeological narrative, um, my, my presentation is not focusing on this. So I'm going to move through rather quickly. If anybody has any questions, um, I would ask you, of course, to reach out to me. I will provide my contact information um, to the members of class, and, and you can get that through them, or you can find me um, on the internet. Uh, but in basic cursory fashion, our understanding has been, for, for about 100 years at least, um, that this area was occupied by indigenous Chibchan speaking peoples. Um, we don't know what groups they might be affiliated with. Down in the Costa Rican section, uh, the southern sector of Greater Nicoya, we know far more about the indigenous peoples, what, what they were called uh, by the Spanish when they arrived, how they referred to themselves, how they, uh, how they looked at one another in this area. But when we come into Nicaragua, we can see that colonization uh, following the Spanish conquest of this area has done tremendous damage to the indigenous and mestizo peoples of this area, their understanding of the past. They have been very disconnected uh, from that past. And as such, Nicaragua stands out not only as the second poorest country on our side of this continent, but also one of the, the least understood culture areas in all of the Americas. At about 800 AD, <laughs> we understand in this narrative that a group of uh, Otomongayan speakers 
who should be referred to as the Mange, but are more frequently referred to as the Chorotega, uh, were understood to have arrived at around 800 AD, bringing the first major Mesoamerican influence from the area of the Pacific coast in Oaxaca um, up into Puebla uh, in the Mixtec area. And there are hints and hints at, at, at Teotihuacan awareness that is coming out uh, in some of the ceramics. And the imagery, the iconography that was coming with that, that was coming with changes that were occurring in the area at this time was held up as evidence uh, for the arrival of, of Mexican people to the region. Um, Ethnohistoric accounts tell us that at the arrival of the Spanish at 1522, uh, that this area, uh, particularly the southern tip, which I'm showing you here uh, in the red circle, this is called the Isthmus of Rivas, but the town of Rivas is what I'm highlighting um, because the Nicarau, who were understood to be uh, Uto Aztec in speaking people, so linguistically related to the Aztec, uh, had come to this region right before the arrival of the Spanish. We do not know exactly when, and the ethnohistoric accounts are, are, are vague with details that allow us to tie this down in time. So again, we have used changes in ceramics to try to make sense of, of what, was, what was visible when the Spanish arrived. There were indigenous speaking people, there were Mange speaking people, and there were Nicarao speaking people, but they did very little to help us truly understand how this multicultural or at least multilinguistic arrangement came to be. Uh, when we started research in the area, um, I have had the good, the good fortune of both my master's and my PhD supervisor having worked in this area before I came to work in the area. So I had insights coming in. The vast majority in 2007 when I entered the program at the University of Calgary uh, was that Rivas, this area in the circle, was one of the most important ceramic production areas uh, in all of Greater Nicoya including both the Southern sector and the Northern sector. Um, we understood due to the sheer volume of ceramic types here that they were being produced here. Um, some time ago, uh, archeometric analyses were conducted. Neutron activation analysis um, is something that has been going on in the research program for this area for quite some time. We've known more about the geochemistry of ceramics than we have about the actual uh, placement of sites uh, or, or what an actual site looks like. Um, so it's a little bit backwards in this area. Um, but Rivas was important. I point it out now because it will play a role later in my talk as I move through. Um, this, as I say, coming in, uh, there's a site called Santa Isabel uh, that you can see highlighted with a dot inside that circle. And this has been a site that has received a lot of attention and thus stands kind of as, as the type site. Uh, for much of Pacific Nicaragua in this area. Go ahead, Cara. So some of the things that show up in the archeological record at about 800 are some pretty fancy ceramics. Uh, I'm going to simplify the discussion of these today, uh, simply to keep us on track, recognizing that a lot of you may have never seen these before. At about 800, this area started producing what I consider to be very beautiful, aesthetically pleasing white slip polychrome ceramics. Um, these were the evidence that is held up uh, as the arrival of Mexicans to the region. Uh, for anyone who has any familiarity uh, with Mixtec ceramics or early Aztec, even later, you will recognize perhaps components or things that look or have a feel of being that way. Uh, and we have held that up, as I say, for a long time as evidence. Um, and the more we tested archaeologically, this seemed quite sound. So when I entered the program, our goal was to try to figure out how many different places were, were these made. We know that they were distributed throughout the, the, the south and the entire north area of Pacific Nicaragua. The understanding that they were being made in that area of Rivas and distributed to the north and the south was where we went. But we wanted to challenge that. We wanted to demonstrate that that was actually what had happened. Um, you can see by taking a look um, where we come through, there was a lot of sites that they have been that they have been found at. I have highlighted sites from which I have received materials in which I've analyzed. Kari, you can go ahead. On the surface, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. 
However, when we look at the earlier pottery from the area, we recognize that it's a significant change. Uh, red slipped bichromes and trichromes were really the fair. When you uh, can, if you can envision the classic Maya at the time when they're, uh, you know, Tikal is coming to the fore, things are changing. The Maya, the Maya Southern Highlands are, are expanding, things are growing. We're making uh, quite simple, quite straightforward pottery when things are really starting to become artistically. Um, and in terms of religion, certainly uh, very symbolic in the areas around us, especially to the north in Mesoamerica. So go ahead, Cara. So the shift at 800 AD to these types of ceramics um, is quite shocking in the archeological record. We see the break, it is consistent um, and it's across all sites. This, this idea, you know, the fact that we could actually see this has always, as I said, supported that understanding that new people arrived at this time. Go ahead, Car. So I come back to these two original, oops, we come back to these two original examples. Um, through the process, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in just a second, of doing archaeometric analyses, kind of will explain. What we discovered is that these ceramics actually were not produced in the Rivas area at all. Uh, in fact, they were coming from an area north of Rivas, an area that was a little bit contested for a long time about whether it actually belonged in this area we call Greater Nicoya or not. In the 1990s, Silvia Salgado from uh, the University of Costa Rica in her own doctoral research uh, went up to this area around Granada City that I have circled on the map here. And the goal was to try to understand if, you know, Greater Nicoya extended that far, if she could see the same things playing out uh, at that site. Um, unfortunately, in hindsight being 2020, we can say she ended up at a site that was quite irregular. Uh, and the ceramics that came out of there did not match very much what we were seeing. There were hints at, at, at ceramic types like I'm showing you here, Papagayo and Pataki um, are, are, our two main, are our two main types that really represent this ceramic change. And she was not finding any of them. And for many years, it, it really led to a decrease in interest for people who wanted to know more about Greater Nicoya, who wanted to know more about Pacific Nicaragua and its role um, in that area and its relationship to Mesoamerican. It seemed at that time that moving north of Rivas was not the way for us to find that. However, um, Jeff McCafferty, following his research in Rivas, moved to the Granada area when I joined the project. So we were able to explore several sites beyond the site that Silvia Salgado explored. And what we found was an absolute wealth um, of ceramic information that supported the idea, not only that the Granada area was involved in Greater Nicoya, but that it was also receiving en masse, if not producing its own versions of these kinds of ceramics. Uh, in the end, what we found out was, because I'm not talking specifically about this, is that that was true. Not only was the Granada area making these ceramics, it was the only area making them and it was distributing them relatively en masse to the rest of the archeological region. Go ahead, Car. The next slide. Very good, thank you very much. I would also note that I cannot see a, a clock right now, so <laughs> you may wanna do that. Uh, what we were interested in was understanding the ceramic economy. Um, Papagayo, the, the orangey red ware that I showed you on the left, and, and Pataki that I showed you the black and white ware on the right were really fundamental, as I say. And what we wanted to know was basically to understand normally what I would do is spend a lot of time right now explaining to you how those archaeometric analyses break down. I would talk to you about how we have taken in conjunction myself with Ron Bishop at the Smithsonian Institution, two different types of analyses um, that together uh, are able to provide not only very, very powerful data, but very powerful data interpretation. Normally what I would show you uh, is those ceramics turned into symbols, 
placed on a on a graph where I could tell you that you know because there is more barium and thorium in these ceramics uh, and less chromium that they're related to this volcano or that volcano and that played a very big role in helping us understand what was going on. Um, as I had noted, this program uh, in neutron activation analysis has been going on for almost 40 years in the region. It was able to show how ceramics pulled apart based on their chemistry, but what it was not able to do is explain why. Um, so the usefulness of, of my contribution was that I brought with me petrography so that I could explain what in the visible things, the macroscopic visible things and microscopic visible things were creating those chemical differences. And through that, we've been able to develop profiles that have allowed us to refine the narrative for this region. Um, normally, I would pull up a slide as I show you here at the bottom and tell you all about what ceramic clays look like, what they contained, whether they had sand and things like that. And it is all very important. Um, all of these together helped us interpret the clays that we were looking at. We could see the content. We could see color. And as, and as I noted, it allowed us to reinterpret the ceramic economy. We now know, we now have a far better idea in a very short period of time of which sites were producing what, um, how they moved about, which sites were most connected. We've done this beautiful job of updating our understanding of the economy and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I was thrilled when I finished my dissertation um, to have accomplished all of this. Cara, if you don't mind switching to the next slide. I was able to say to anyone who could bring me or show me a pot, oh, that pot belongs to this site. For example, this pot right here was produced in the Granada area at a site that we refer to, uh, we don't know if it's real. I have tried to fossilize this in my dissertation, it may change, but Halteva, it was the name that was associated with the indigenous community there when the Spaniards arrived. Tara, go on to the next slide. But there was a problem. Long before I graduated and certainly after I graduated, everyone who has had their PhD who didn't move directly into a job has that spot where you're no longer under pressure. Right uh, In that short period after I graduated, when I had time to think, I recognized that in truth, despite this great advance in understanding the ceramic economy, I knew absolutely nothing more about the culture I was trying to understand than when I started. I was missing at least half the picture. I could see through scientific analyses, you know, what people were doing, where they were doing it, how they did it. We were getting pretty specific. Um, up until about 2015, uh, in, in the types of things that we were able to determine, we could see how communities were behaving. In fact, I chose a communities of practice approach to interpret uh, the analytical data. And in the end, I, I, I knew that although we had identified these active communities, we still knew nothing about them. All of this research gave us great insight. They provided a methodology for all the, all the physical, pragmatic things we wanted to know but they could not answer one question. This type of science cannot answer one question. And that is why, why were they doing these things? Why did they change? Why do we see, why did people come from other areas? Importantly, in all of this, and I, sorry, I meant to say on the last slide, one of the greatest things we found was that despite the massive change in ceramic repertoire that we saw occur around 800 AD, we had absolutely no evidence for the arrival of new people. Um, on honing down in our refinement of the ceramic and of the ceramic economy, we found that nothing had changed. These were the same potters. Don't get me wrong, certainly people could have arrived. There is reason to believe that new linguistic groups are, are in the region uh, and that are combining, joining, synthesizing um, in what appeared to be some kind of cooperative way with the existing groups who were there. You know, but if it was, if, if this change in ceramics did not represent an intrusion of Mexican culture, how did it come about? Why did that happen? It had blown our narrative wide open that one point, not too much change. The rearrangement of our understanding of sites of production, 
But the timeline, other than that very important AD 800 thing, um, you know, was not really called into great question. It was just a refinement. This one, however, broke our story and we need to fix it. I say this looking forward because we have not found any resolve to this broken story. Um, with all the things that have happened in the past couple of years, it's been quite busy and there's been a, um, a little, bit of, little bit of static on the screen. There's not a lot of archeology span that's happening in this region and we've come to a bit of a stop. And this breather has allowed me over the last few years to really think about how to reorient. Um, I don't want to say anything negative about archaeology because I love archaeology. I see the value, I see the power, and I see the strength in it. But it was not helping me, the approach I was taking, to understand what was going on. To get at the why, needed to expand my knowledge. I needed to remove my archaeologist hat and put my anthropologist hat on. For the remainder of my talk, I'm not going to talk about the results of research. I'm going to talk to you about constructing a research question and how difficult it has been in an area for which we have no understanding. Uh, what has been necessary is the change in approach taken by me. I will implicate myself specifically here. Um, and this is really moving from science to ethnoscience, right? The, the need to understand how science worked for the people I'm studying, not from my perspective, from theirs. What were these things? What was the meaning? Right, we may look at this instead of ethnoscience and more cling to the term of ethnosemantics, right? Trying to get at the meanings that cultures use and how they categorize and understand the world around them because it is different than non-Indigenous peoples. I recognize now over the last five years, I've done a lot of research and I've uh, interacted with a lot of people, you know, about how limited this approach is. In the region I come from, we do not have an art historian. We do not have a linguist. We do not have an in-house uh, ethnographer. We do not have cultural people that all the areas around us have that contribute and help build archeology span into a beautiful, robust, more holistic picture. We are located almost directly beside the Maya area. We understand so much about the Maya. Obviously there's so much still to understand. But then to move, you know, just a short way down the coast and to have something that seems devoid of religion. We can see symbolic media, you know, but we can't get at their worldview. We need to do this to understand the culture. And to do that, we have to try to understand what they are saying on their terms, not on our terms and specifically not from a Western scientific perspective. We need to start looking at the things that they did that we consider functional or practical as also containing ritual aspects. They may be ritual in a pragmatic way in that I do step A and then I do step B and then I make a pot and here I am. But we need to understand or we need to try to get a better understanding of what it is that motivates those physical practices that result in objects that are used for very important purposes. We need to understand the ritual aspect of their practice as well as just their, their physical gestures and the resultant products. We need to get a better understanding of how they symbolically communicated using pottery. Uh, we understand from uh, ethno history that perhaps there were codices in Pacific Nicaragua. We cannot demonstrate that. These are stories that were collected by ethno historians and Spaniards in the field at that time. Uh, there's so many elements that we can look at about symbolic communication. But today I'm going to talk specifically about color because it's played an important role in driving how I think for a long time. Go ahead, Cara. The red and the black contrast is visible. It's something that's visible across all of Mesoamerica. It plays a role in, in the way that that thought, structure, meaning, and purpose is organized for the Aztec, for the Maya, and also for Chichen groups to the south. However, uh, over the last five years, as I have educated myself in the worldview of different places, I see that despite being neighbors, these are not always the same, even though there may be things that are linked. In discussing worldview, 
we really have to start to understand that we are not looking necessarily at kingdoms as we are looking at in the Maya area. We're looking at perhaps what I believe to be um, what we would call in anthropology a religious basis of animism. Um, derived from the term anima, it really is related to the idea of soul or breath, right? The belief that all things in the world are animated by a spirit. This is an indigenous world view that permeates the entire globe. And it is certainly very strong uh, here in the Americas. Um, this includes objects. It can be human made objects. It varies from culture to culture and there are different rules. Um, there's different norms. There's different things that are acceptable and different things that are expected. And this is really what we need to get at for our area. Um, spirits and deities are important. We recognize gods. And in the iconographic analysis of ceramics from Pacific Nicaragua, particularly these that look more uh, what has been referred to as codex style, um, you know, we look to have one-to-one -one correlations. I'm guilty of this, trying to search the ceramics, looking for something Maya, looking for something Zapotec, looking for something that can give some idea of how these are linked, right? But the realization and I'll walk through this with you a little bit, is that there are spirits and deities and they share similarities with all the cultures around them. There are Pan-American things that exist. There are people who have dedicated their whole entire scholarly um, careers to finding these Pan-American these pan similarities. And somewhere in the middle of similarity and difference, we can find who these people were to get some insight into their culture, to understand how they understood spirits and deities. They had mythology. It is written on their ceramics. It may have been written on their textiles. It may have been written in books, but we do not have access to those right now. Um, these contain sacred stories. They are not simply aesthetic pieces of art that an artist, an artist chose, I have decided I will make this today. They have cultural rules. Um, this is ritual art. Not every piece of ceramic in any area is a ritual piece of art. But if you accept that these are animistic cultures, then there is some form of spiritual practice involved in creating any of them. We should be concerned with aspects of sacred time and sacred space. And although I will not talk about it today, as I walk through, Building this research question, I recognize that there are aspects um, of these ceramics. Uh, we don't just randomly choose tripod supports. We don't just randomly choose an elevated base. These all play into the worldview that is being articulated in the ceramics that we see. They may imply sacred space. There are aspects that imply sacred time. And all of these things taken together uh, would be very important and fundamental to something that we call in anthropology social rights of intensification. That is a super fancy way of, of saying that rights or rituals that are involved with the articulation of worldview, right? The production and the reproduction of culture, the articulation and the repeated articulation of social norms, social expectations, and spiritual or religious duties as well, depending on what kind of thing is being shown. Uh, so for an example, we are on a volcanic chain. As I noted before, this has made it a lot easier to do compositional analysis, but it has also added different aspects of an environment and an ecological reality in which these people lived that they needed to mediate. And it may not have been the same as someone who lived on a flat plain or on a river's edge that had no volcanoes. Their experience of the world was unique to the world that they lived in, despite being connected to all the people around them. We often see, and at about this time of 800, we now know that the volcanoes have played a role and have changed on the landscape. But just to show you the idea that, that vessels take the shape, these are interpreted as representing mountains and often volcanoes. Um, and we see that an animistic or animal uh, sometimes anthropomorphic images are seated atop these mountains or these volcanoes, whatever is being shown. And we need to start to recognize these as the deities, right? Or the spirits with which these people interacted with. They're not merely animals in the landscape, though they reflect the animals in the local landscape.
Go ahead, Car. So important, something that has come to my mind and certainly some people may not agree, but I recognize that the potter on a very small scale also plays the role of creator. They are creating from the things of the environment, something that is not just environmental components, but that also contains spiritual components. I'm interested in elements of matter and the way I introduce it with the title here is a very Western perspective. Right? But the understanding of Earth's elements is present in all cultures around the world. In Mesoamerica, we see that they are there. They're recognizable in the sacred 20-day calendars, um, each one slightly different uh, for the cultures throughout Mesoamerica. Uh, but two good examples would be the Maya Zolkin or the Zapotec Pie. Um, these are very strongly tied, the elements and the sacred calendar, uh, to concepts of balance. I've spent a lot of time speaking with Indigenous leaders um, in Canada, some of which I know through conducting archaeology in Canada in the past, um, but also people that I've come into contact with more recently. And several times I've taken the opportunity to suggest what it is that I'm looking at. Each one of them has always told me, no matter what you're focusing on, recognize that what they were likely focusing on was balance. When I first came in, uh, the idea of these elements were important, but I never recognized how they might link to spirituality. Um, the elements are an important part of creation myths. We see this across all Mesoamerican cultures. Um, they're necessary for the production and reproduction, not just of the universe, right? But also life on earth. The idea of circular thinking, that everything is cyclical is important. And it's been very hard to break out of my own mindset to access, access this, but I recognize the fundamental necessity of it. In truth, not only are these things required um, for spiritual knowledge, uh, for cultural knowledge, they're also required to produce pottery. <laughs> so the four elements being earth, water, air, and fire. Sarah? In ritual practice, I, I will jet back for just a little bit right now. Um, because there was something I had noticed that I didn't realize I had noticed. And it is really the basis of this new research question that I'm in the process of developing right now. Um, we recognize that pottery workshops were headed by technical specialists, right? Um, but through this, through this engagement with trying to understand and learn more about indigenous worldview, not just one culture, right? But around the world to try to get a more holistic perspective on this. Um, I recognize that these potters would have been invested with cosmological, social, and ritual knowledge as well. They knew what they had to do to make things that were important for ritual. They had ritual practice to create objects used in other ritual practices. They were responsible for the creation of devices used in private and public sacred ritual. Therefore, this was not something that was probably taken lightly. In fact, the vast majority of the ceramics that we have recovered uh, from Pacific Nicaragua come from mortuary areas, indicating that they were used in mortuary rites. Um, the idea that these needed to function properly in their role in the universe, whether the, whether the person who had passed away was, was being you know, shuttled along to a new part of the journey, I don't know. We don't know anything. But what we do need to do is reorient our perspective so we can start to access from a different way. Um, important to this is the idea of creation and ritual animation. Um, and I believe now from the perspective I'm coming from that potters in this creator role were also responsible for giving life to the vessels. If they were the type of vessels that would be used in important ceremonies. Um, <clears throat> so with ritual animation and animism, the idea is that spirit by the creator, the real one, um, or the creator in, in role uh, is something that has to be breathed in. Whether it is a new baby being born and all indigenous cultures have different points when the spirit enters the body and the breath of life is given. Some is when it is cutting the umbilical cord. Some is when, when it comes through the birth canal and first reach the outside. We don't know about here quite yet. Um, but we know that those things are accessible if we try hard enough. Um, while I was undertaking my analytical analysis and I was looking at Papagayo and Pataki, once we realized that they were being made 
by the same potters in the same time periods in likely the same workshops, something started to stand out. Um, it's not something that was meant to be seen by the public, but it's something that provides a little bit of insight into ritual practice in pottery production. Um, when I first saw this, I had noted that, that the papagayo, the red and orange ones, were always fired to a bright, bright, fully oxidized. My hope is that everyone knows what that means. That means there has been enough fire, enough heat, and enough air to remove all the carbon material, all the properties um, that, that we can see that darken, uh, that they had made every effort to make these as bright as possible, despite the fact that they would not be seen. Um, I also started to know that in, notice that in Pataki, they were often showing with darker pastes, although they were also fully oxidized. I wrote this off. I made a note about it in my dissertation, and I wrote these off as not important. I had said, oh, it's probably the wall thickness. Uh, maybe it had something to do with different, because they're using different paint colors, maybe they had to fire one longer than the other. I was coming up with all kinds of scientific functional explanations for why they might do something. What I had really missed and what I have gone back to see now is that Pataki, um, the one that is black and white for the most part, had an extra step that was taken. And there was an extra step that was meant to modulate the air. At first I thought that this was only Pataki and then I realized that they also had to modulate the amount of oxygen that was allowed in during the firing process to create that bright, almost neon orange color. For a while, I really believed that this was intentional, that it was some kind of secret buried knowledge that was in the pot. Um, it might be the case, but I recognize now that these are likely trace evidence of ritual acts carried out in pottery manufacture. Um, they are consistent. They're not standardized because these pots were fired in an open firing pit. Um, they could manage and they were very good um, at controlling the environment that the firing took place in. But we do see massive variation. And as I say, it's something that's very easy to write off and still you go, until you go back and you start to look through hundreds of them. Um, I stepped away at that point and I left it. What I recognized, as I said, was just ritualization in the firing process. What I'm showing here um, is an actual vessel. I have been limited by COVID restrictions on what things I could access and photograph. So bear with me as I show you this ugly pot. Um, I do not have a picture of paste uh, from the bright neon orange one, but it would look very similar to this, which is a Pataki base. If you could see the rest, you would see that the paint, the iconography is dominated by black. But what has been achieved is not bright neon orange, but a dark, um, something that we might call brick red, and it can go all the way into browns and it can shade into gray. What it shows us is that at one point, there's a suffocation of the pot. During the ritual, during the practice of firing it, it's consistent and we see it across all. An opening of the oxygen again occurs in Papagayo. We see that consistently as well. Go ahead, Connie. It was only a little thing, as I say, and it just has been kind of hanging around in my head over the years. Once I started to learn a little bit more about ritual, about symbolism, about religion, about worldview, um, about a whole bunch of things that I did not know about, um, the importance of this um, became higher. I can tell by Cara's face she's struggling right now. <laughs> can I do a time check with someone? It is uh, 145, there's about 15 minutes left. Okay, wonderful, thank you very much. No worries, Kara. take your time. Just go to, yeah. there we go. I don't know if it's the next one because I can't see them all. <laughs> this came down to, um, and it's going to seem a little bit silly. As I said, the black and the red were always obvious. The fact that this was denoting two different realms in some different way, I don't think anyone who has ever worked in the, the region would argue about. 
our understanding of what these meant, however, is a little bit different. Um, because I am building a research question, my intent is not to show my entire hand right now. What I'm more interested in is showing you um, how this change of approach uh, has changed the way that we can reconstruct understanding. Uh, what I'm offering for the remainder few minutes, and I'm just about to wrap up actually, um, is the proposal that I'm starting to work for. What I'm hoping is for feedback, in all honesty. What I'm hoping is to maybe uh, spark an interest in one mind uh, or to influence some other people to begin to look at this. Uh, trying to get at the worldview, the cosmology and the symbolism inherent in our pottery is my primary focus and I'm sure will consume the remainder of my life. Um, the problem is, is that we don't have a lot of people coming to work in this area. Uh, so we really need to inspire some people to want to resolve problems that are left outstanding. There is so much to learn. Um, everywhere else that we are learning things, um, people are adding to the knowledge base. We're still in the process of creating it and there's so much room for advancement. So what I'm gonna focus on is symbolic color and this proposal. Um, I believe that there are sacred colors. Um, they are different based on time period. There's alterations, uh, I should say. They don't change significantly, but we do see additions. Um, I have chosen to focus on Papadino Pataki simply because after reviewing everything, I recognize that every set of pottery produced in every community across all of Greater Nicoya has their own version of how colors should be used. With the exception of the red and the black, they are mediated and negotiated by other secondary colors. Um, and we need to get a handle on this. Things change. Um, we have long periods within which these are produced. Pataki was produced at least from AD 770, sorry, to 1300. And that's a long period of time for a ceramic to be produced with no change. So I'm focusing here, oh, hold on, not ready yet. <laughs> focusing here on sacred colors that I have identified as associated externally, not in the paste, in the paint, um, that fit with Papagayo and Pataki. I have to be honest, I don't know how these are gonna work. I anticipate that this is not correct, but we need to kick off. And I'm not sure of a better place to start it um, than in isolation from my home where I am safe. No. <laughs> so the sacred colors we see in the Papagayo and Pataki suite, um, I believe line up with something we might recognize as a color wheel. Uh, which is called a medicine wheel in North America, um, but allow us to have an understanding of how things relate. Obviously, there are other sacred aspects that might follow this wheel. I'm looking specifically at how they relate to the elements that I discussed, fire, air, water, and earth. Uh, we understand these in all other cultures to be associated with cardinal directions. And so I have done this here. As I say, I'm not making a final statement. It's a proposal to see what people think. Um, so in this instance, uh, orange, the color orange in Papagayo likely represents in one aspect, the element of fire. Brown on the other half seems to be related to elements related to air. And this can include wind or just simply oxygen. Um, black is definitely related to water. I don't wanna make any um, discussion about the underworld or how that is perceived because we need to not keep putting the, the cart in front of the horse. Um, red seems to be strongly associated with concepts tied to the earth. They are all sacred and they all appear to be tied to both deities and spirits. Go ahead. So what I'm providing here is just a little tiny taste. Um, I, I appreciate you coming along with me for the ride through my own personal experience. Uh, but what I started to notice and something that is really seized on in analyses are how many colors are introduced. Once we begin to see polychrome, we're talking about more than three in most cases. We recognize bichromes and trichromes. So the addition of paints has often been seen as decorative. It has been interpreted as decorative and not necessarily carrying with it a lot of, of, of meaning or a lot of spiritual weight. Um, I beg to differ. Uh, we see very simply the move from red and black to the move to red, black, orange, and brown. Uh, brown can be modulated. We see it happen. I don't understand the meaning, and I'm certain that there is one. We also don't understand how this cultural group perceived color. When we approach from our understanding of color categorization, it limits our understanding if, of how other people understand color. 
So I'm careful with this. What we recognize is brown shows up with these vessels. It is in both Pataki, which I'm showing you here on the left, and Papagayo, an example of which I'm showing you here on the right. It is consistently associated with feathers and things or, or entities, spirits, perhaps deities, um, perhaps shaman, right? In a, in a state of altered consciousness. We don't know, I don't want to guess. Um, but we see feathery things associated with the color brown. Go ahead, prior to the next slide. It is not just those aspects where we can see them on wings. Despite the fact that it's very hard to see inside Pataki, there are a lot of different things going on. There is often a flying entity who flies a lot like in the shape of Superman, or if anyone has studied things off the West Coast or from Oaxaca, you may recognize this as the form of flying for a Yawi. Um, we see that there. And again, we see brown showing up in the feathered crest in what appears to be a mask that this entity is wearing. I don't know that we are associated. I don't know that we are associated in this way. There are a million photos that I could show you. I want to just, as I said, whet the appetite of people to start to look at these things. Is this air? Is this flying? Is this a color that, that communicates those concepts in worldview? Do they communicate altered states as well as weathered states, as well as weather states? I don't know. What is their link to creation? By starting to identify symbolic elements, we can see the contexts in which they are used and we can start to draw out better, more realistic, more emic or insider interpretations of what is going on in these very complex narratives. Go ahead, Car. Orange is another. Um, I'm showing you a picture here of a vessel uh, from the Denver Art Museum that uh, has post-depositional damage. So it has actually darkened the colors. And I will wrap up talking, very, talking about this. Um, Fire is an important thing. For a long time, I was very sure that red represented the sun and the east and fire and all of those concepts together in the way we see them throughout Mesoamerican cultures. But after reviewing these kinds of things and starting to gather data together, recognize that red and orange are not two variants of the same color. They're not being shown on a color spectrum in the way that we might think about it. They're in fact representing two very different things. And what I'm going to argue here uh, or move forward and collect data so that I can actually do statistical analyses is that this color orange always shows up with things associated with fire. Often we will see a Pataki vessel and much unfortunately analysis is done with photographs rather than actual objects. And I don't just mean by random people, I mean by scholars, myself included, have done so in my history simply because we lack access to these objects. So often what you will see if you are to peruse the Denver Art Museum website or any other website is a view that looks very much like what you see here on the left. Um, and much interpretation is done to try to understand what's happening with the face, what's happening with this head, when in truth the narrative is captured in the back of the vessel. Um, if you are able to hold and analyze and look at these things, most people do not know who have seen these objects, that there are entire narratives on the back. When we see orange, it seems to always be associated with a very specific individual. And I will wrap up with this individual. And I believe that if you work in the Maya area, you may recognize him once you start to have a better look at him. He has a hooked nose that looks very much like a Roman nose or a beak. And he shows up in almost everything associated with fire, although he has very different ways that he shows up. Um, just to show you here on the back, not only are we able to see that color brown associated with feathers that we see in the trailing banners um, and incense burners and other things that are, are going on in this ritual scene, we see that that idea of air and wind is also tied to fire, something very necessary for fire to grow, be maintained, or to happen at all, right? It's about, it seems to me that in here is not just trying to say this is fire, this is water, this is air but to understand how these cultures negotiated the different elements to keep balance in their world. I don't necessarily understand what's happening in these scenes. 
I'm working on it. My hope is to get other scholars who are far better at this working on it as well. We need a team so that we can make developments like we see in the other area. Carb, go ahead to the next scene. I don't have time to analyze him in the way that I wanted to, and I don't want to go over time. Oops. We see this, we see this entity again uh, in another version of Papagayo, which is playing out in a very different kind of scene. The form of the vessel tells us it's taking place in a different area of sacred space. Um, the supports are indicative of this, and I won't go into that today, but it is something that will be publishing hopefully very soon. Um, instead, looking on the interior of the bowl, we see someone very similar to that character we saw on the back of the mortuary vessel, the Pataki vessel, playing out in Shaman. The same ritual is not being carried out here, but you will see the hook nose god with the curl. It's a little bit of a Roman nose. I refer to it as a flubber nose. Um, I won't say who I think it is right now. I'll wait to see if anyone has any questions. But again, we see the color associated. This person represents some aspect of a fire god. And it is repeated pattern. And once I was able to see the difference the color made, I could start to pull these apart. In hindsight, it seems very clear. Uh, when you're faced with a massive imagery that makes no sense and for which you have no Rosetta Stone to make sense of what is going on, it has been a difficult task just to organize the data in order to study it. Go ahead, Carl. And I just wanted to, to finalize by saying, you know, this need to understand mythology is, is principle in what we do in Greater Nicoya. Um, I truly believe others may disagree that we will move no further forward. There are no scientific analyses we can do. They may give us some spatial reference on sites or things like that, but they will not provide us any insight into who these people were. To me, there's a problem that we are the only culture who has no culture in all of the Americas. And, and, and I believe it is worthwhile. I believe that it will help inform Mesoamerica about what its extent was, its role in influencing other things. Um, and I show you this picture just to show you one of the most complicated uh, mythological narratives presented in a piece that I have ever seen. My acknowledgments here are for all the people who have stimulated my thoughts provided me access to materials I would no otherwise not have access to or help me along my way. Thank you very much everyone for your time today. Thank you, Carrie, for a uh, wonderful talk. And if you have time, um, can we open the floor for a few questions? Um, for those of you on Zoom, feel free to ask or type it in. And for those watching on Facebook Live, you can type it into the comment section and we can uh, manage them that way. Uh, Jeff had a question. He says he has to leave for a class, but okay. it's just a very specific question. Do you have the full code for P A seven four four? Zero zero four four. Zero zero four four. <laughs> There's an archaeologist <laughs> nerdness, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> So we have a question from Susan who says, thank you, Dr. Dennett. She has a meeting and she cannot stay, but she really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very uh, she much. She was wondering if there might have been changes that may have affected the colors on the pottery. So what we see today might not be what the original creators had intended. Absolutely. Uh, yes. And the second part is she was also wondering uh, what your thoughts were on the figure of Mishkuatl and if that relates to the color wheel that you mentioned. All right, so I'll take this opportunity then to speak freely. Um, none of what I'm saying is fact. I, I wanna be clear about that. This is all an exercise in trying to understand what's going on. Um, I, Susan, I very much appreciate this. Absolutely. Um, all of my focus has traditionally been on creating explanations for things that I see. Um, I see a physical thing, I require a scientific explanation for it. I, I need to show it repeated. Patterning is really important. Um, took a while to recognize that that patterning is also crucial for understanding religion. Um, <laughs> uh, so yes, there are. There's post-depositional things. And in Greater Nicoya, all throughout Pacific Nicaragua and into um, northwestern Costa Rica, we see a lot of damage due to field clearing for agriculture. Um, this pottery is not prized the, by most people who are doing day-to-day -day activities. As I said, 
um, whether mestizo indigenous or otherwise living in Pacific Nicaragua, these people have been very severed uh, from their historical past in a way that I, I cannot find um, a severance like that anywhere else in the Americas. Um, it must have been brutal. Uh, but in truth, we see a lot of damage from post-depositional sooting. We see exposure to light. We see obviously exposure to the elements in the ground. Um, but in truth, we are uh, at a great benefit because they are using mineral-based paints. Um, you can change some things about them, but the, mineral, the minerals cannot be altered without either heat that achieves a certain temperature for a certain amount of time. Um, there are other things. Uh, I have gone through a gamut trying to find the Western scientific explanation for why I see these differences. Um, so yes, definitely what we are seeing is not exactly, exactly precisely what was intended. But we do believe, and they are systematically preserved in the same way, um, that because they are not plant-based plant paints for the most part, that they are preserved in the same way. It's just their hue or their chroma that has been altered by exposure. I'll, I'll show part of my hand. And if anyone publishes a paper on this before I get the chance to, I'll, be, I'll cry. Um, I truly believe that what we are looking at in that we have Otomangayan speakers uh, who are coming in with, inf who are influenced or structured, I should say, organized in a worldview related to what's going on along the Pacific coast. Uh, we're seeing things related to Zapotec cult, uh, to Mixtec religious cult. And the Aztec have seen, and Teotihuacan is a huge um, component that these creators are drawing on. It is not an influence. This is being selected and brought in by the potters and utilized in very specifically ways unique to the region. I believe that that orange man is somehow a negotiation between what would become Mishkoatl for the Aztec and Itzamna for the Yucatec Maya. Um, I also believe that this change that we are seeing um, at 800 reflects a change that is actually occurring and is recognized among Mesoamerican scholars. And it was a change from trade that dominated the Pacific coast to the movement of trade out to the Caribbean coast. I'm not suggesting that it was one or the other, but we see a real big change. And a lot of that has to do with work um, that has that based on work that has been conducted by Richard Callahan of the University of Calgary, reconstructing climate regimes on both sides in the water. So when we were starting to go into a very bad weather regime between 600 and 900 AD on the Pacific coast, things were greatly ameliorating, coming out of what I understand to have been cataclysmic, uh, something we cannot comprehend from our experience of hurricanes, were starting to end and trade was increasing. Um, so that's a big one. So to be honest with you, the color wheel that I mentioned it draws on what I have learned from my studies in Aztec, which are all later. There is, that is working backwards when we use Aztec materials. There is no one-to-one -one correlation between the two. I wanna be clear about that temporally. Although a lot of Aztec ideas are being borrowed from both Mixtec and Teotihuacan, right? Backgrounds. I hope that answers your question, although I know it was excessive. So I think we have time for, for one or two more. Um, we have a question here from Jamie Houston Dixon. Um, Someone else I know very well. Yes, I recognize the name as well. Mm -hmm. um, she apologizes if you touched on this already, but she is curious whether the orange and brown colors started appearing around the same time or if one seems to have preceded the other. Uh, one great thing about working with Jeff McCafferty was that he uh, really allowed us to focus down on different things in one site. Um, instead of making a choice to do either depth or coverage, we tried to bend and do all those things. So in truth, we do not see specific orange and brown. We, we see modulation of red up until we get to about 850 or 900, and then you see these colors come in. Papagayo and Pataki are being developed because we have done so little archeological research and because museums and things like that seize on very specific, beautiful uh, versions, it's not always uh, easy to see this. 
Um, but it was actually a 200 year period of development before those polychromes show up. So yes, they do, the, the, the explosion of color occurs at the same time. I don't know why, I don't know how. I, in my mind right now, and the way I will phrase it is that these are, are um, chemistry or alch alchemic developments that are going on within the potters themselves because we don't see this change taking place in other areas around us at the same time. Um, any more refined than that, I, I cannot say simply because we don't have the data. And it's nice to, to see your name there, Jamie. So uh, Diana has a question. Um, do you find it useful to also do research on the Mexica worldview to better understand the worldview in, in this area? I've done everything backwards, Diana. And I appreciate that question. It has slowed me down, but at the same time, um, it has helped. It has helped me not fall into the trap of being trained to think a certain way. I suppose that's it. Everything I have learned started with Mexica. Uh, it was very much a, a direct historic <laughs> event that I took. Um, I first tried to start with the Maya, but I could not do it. I understood the Maya. I was comfortable with it. I had taken you know, four years of undergraduate under Paul Healy, uh, who very much uh, exposed me, even though it was not where I was going to, add, to, to the basics of everything. Uh, once I went in there, I had a very hard time with the correlation. Uh, I went then to the Zapotec. I saw that for Javier Urseed. Um, I did not know enough before I started asking that man questions. Um, and I'm sure he, I have an apology to make to him one day. Um, when I finally uh, reached um, Elizabeth Boone's work, uh, her stories in red and black, I seized that because I recognized we had that juxtaposition of colors. And it was actually from there, learning about, about, the, uh, about the, just the whole Aztec, Mexica culture, I recognized that it was more deities, more gods that I could handle. But I also started to recognize that these were what I had. And that, that as we see a proliferation of deities among the Mexica, they didn't probably start that way. So I had to work my way backwards. Once I could start to pull out what was more Mexican, and I say that because I don't want to simply attribute it to a culture, there's more than that. I understood, or at least I would just say right now I have the understanding that we are more of a, of a, of a what the Mexica have based their worldview out of, early Mixtec, early Zapotec, things that are pulsing in, in uh, Tehuantepec, in that area, this is where our worldview is coming from. It's being modulated and negotiated later in time by our growing connections through the Lenca and through the Alua with the Maya of the Yucatan. We start demonstrating things, they're their stories, but they're told, told mainly with, with Pacific coastal characters. It's a syncretism that's occurring. I cannot, get, I cannot blame or attribute anyone, but when you start to break this down and in what I will publish is to try to show the component parts and how together Plus, with uh, different things that are coming from the Chief Chan area, culminate to an ethnogenesis, something that Jeff and I have written about before, but not in this kind of way. It is a different culture. It is made up of these component parts, but it is definitely different. And the Mexica provided me the door into this world. I have a, a question, which I think you, you you touched on a bit in one of your earlier answers. And I'm just wondering if there are any um, potters in Nicaragua making pottery using traditional methods today that you could draw on or, or gain insights from. I've been very fortunate to be hooked up with um, the cooperativas that are there. So those are basically guilds, right? Or, or, or little things of potters that have gotten together. Um, they understand how the symbols play out. We don't understand and they're honest about it. They recognize, oh, this is linked to this, or this is probably linked to this, but the narrative is dead. Um, there may be people with it. I, I'm not aware of who they are, which is why I say we need an ethnographer. We need a linguist. We need all the things that, that have made the Maya area great, right? Or have made the Aztec area great, is this interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary attack, right? To pull out and challenge one another and grow. It, it's really scholarship 
that we need to get at those things. Um, and it will help us ask local people better questions. The ones we're asking right now aren't eliciting the answers we, we want, <laughs> right? So we need, to, we need to stop being so etic, right? So outsider perspective, try to get inside and reformat, reformulate our questions. Thanks, Matt, I appreciate that. I don't see any other questions have, have come in. Um, give another few seconds here, but um, just take the opportunity to thank you again. And I think Cara just unmuted herself. Say a few well, I was going to ask a question only if there's time and oh. only if there are any <laughs> other questions. Um, so you were talking about the, the pottery workshops and they've talked about that a lot in the Maya region. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm really for we've got to get hands on with these ceramics to really, really understand them as well. And, and so I was wondering if you had thought about the production of the ceramics and the painting. Do you think that there were divisions of labor or do you think that there were people that were creating the ceramics from start to finish and they were creating them and adding the paint as well? I don't know if you've thought about that. I have absolutely thought about what you're asking me. Um, something we're having a hard time getting a handle on um, is that we have some really sloppy work. The firing is also not correct, uh, right? Like it's not following those standards. In truth, the patterns we're seeing are, um, the patterns I'm seeing, I have to stop saying we, patterns I'm seeing are, are in the beautiful stuff. They're in the things that are in the richest mortuary areas. However, we're also can see, um, you know, from, from survey and things like that, some, if I may, but ugly, versions of all of these things. They appear to have been made as well en masse and were probably used by regular people in the regular house for the same kinds of rituals. I can see those being made in a modular fashion, uh, right? That the potter creates one, then the painter comes in and it seems that the painters weren't being paid much. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, <laughs> Uh, because they weren't trying very hard. And I think that the implement in those cases mattered more than the iconography. Um, when it comes to the other things, I do believe that, the, that it was modular. I do believe they probably all of potters had the ability to do all parts. Um, but at the point that we are making this, um, I'm gonna use a word that hopefully you will see come out in a publication soon is that we're not working with pottering communities like that. We're working with guilds. Uh, and not in a guild, not in a guild in the way that it would be brought in in, in the terms of thinking of like a, an Aztec guild or, or like that. This, these weren't commodities um, that were designed to be used in, I guess what's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't, it wasn't just money-based or exchange-based. This was all ritual-based things. Um, there's too much tightness. There's never an error. There are very few errors. Although I believe that these were family-based lineages and they were probably looking at different, different family members, different generations or different parts working on them, but they were definitely working together. Heather McKillop, thank you, Heather. <laughs> I'm sure that if for Mesoamericanists, like I say, I, I put the challenge out here. If you're gonna continue to put me on the bottom of your map, Open the door and start talking to us. <laughs> Challenge laid. There we go. Um, my hope is that people will, will be interested. And my hope is, is that by us demonstrating that we have a, an approach, something that's structured in anthropology, not just structured in our own minds, that other people will get on board, at least be interested or hopefully contribute. I wish I could see everyone's face. It's a real disappointment not to. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I know Matt's monitoring the, the Facebook, so I, I, I assume there aren't any more questions from there. There are no questions. There are a number of people who have congratulated you and thank you for such a great talk. Thank um, you. But Thanks to all of them. <laughs> Wonderful. So I, I guess there, that's a good time, One fifteen sharp mm. to ends the webinar. So again, thank you ever so much, Carrie, for joining us and uh, presenting your, your wonderful, interesting thoughts with us today and allowing us to record the lecture as well. I uh, much appreciate it. Yeah, thank you to everyone else that joined us on Zoom and Facebook as well. And we'll see you in a few weeks for Liz Paris's talk. I'm very much looking forward to that. Thank you to everyone and to everyone in the audience. And I wish you all a wonderful weekend.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, if you could stay for a few minutes. Of uh, course. We can, uh, we can just uh, say goodbye, so. Asta.